that deny this link, and it's from 2009. And it was published in the journal Cancer Epidemiology and Biomarkers Prevention. And here we are. And this paper is entitled Risk Factors for Triple Negative Breast Cancer in Women Under the Age of 45 Years. Now, triple negative breast cancer is the, by far and away the, the most aggressive and deadly form of breast cancer that, that women are afflicted with. Uh, they're missing three critical receptors on the surface that are necessary, you know, necessary for treatment to the cancer. I won't get into all that. It's extremely difficult to treat. Well, what did they find? In their results section, <laughs> it's, uh, it would be funny if it weren't so deadly. Um, in their results, they state that here we go. In analyses of all 897 breast cancer cases, subtypes combined, the multivariate adjusted odds ratios for examined risk factors were consistent with the effects observed in previous studies on younger women, specifically older age, family history of breast cancer, earlier menarche age, induced abortion, and oral contraceptive use were associated with an increased risk for breast cancer. out of their own mouths. When the cameras are rolling, they say one thing to the public. But when they do their research and they publish it in the journals that only other professionals read, they say quite another. Now in this study, they showed the following. And for any young woman here, this is extremely sobering, so pay attention. For women who began oral contraceptive use, after the age of 22, their risk for triple negative breast cancer went up 240%. For women between the ages of 18 and 22 who began oral contraceptive use, their risk of triple negative breast cancer prior to the age of 45 okay, went up 270%. And in women who began oral contraceptive use before the age of 18, so we're not talking women anymore, right? They were doing this when they were children, okay? Their incidence of triple negative breast cancer went up 540%. This is deadly. Let's go back and consider the World Health Organization's group one carcinogen list and what's on there, right? The combined estrogen progestin pill and hormone replacement therapy which leads to another issue that you'll see quoted out there. And you'll be told, listen, when you have a 40% increased risk for breast cancer, that's not really scientifically, epidemiologically significant. We look for at least a 200% increased risk and we consider that significant. All right. There have been 55 million abortions in this country since 1973. Dr. Joel Brin, Yale-educated endocrinologist at the City University of New York, did an analysis. And based on the numbers that we can all agree upon, 40% is the lowest number that we can all agree upon, Dr. Brin's analysis estimates that there are about 300,000 women whose breast cancer comes from the experience of induced abortion. Statistically, that may be insignificant in certain circles, until it's your wife, or your mother, or your sister, or your sweetheart. Then it's real. Then it's real. 300,000, those are real numbers, okay? But they do this. This is the way they spin the science, you know? As one of my attorney friends said very cynically one day, the truth is irrelevant, Jerry. It only matters what you do with it in court. <laughs> no. um, it can't go on like that. When in 2003, maybe a lot of people remember, hormone replacement therapy came under the gun because women were developing postmenopausal breast cancer, right? late 90s, early 2000s, 
In 2003, women just stopped taking hormone replacement therapy. They just turned their backs on it, you know, it, it fell into disgrace and disuse. And what happened? In a seven year period, the incidence of postmenopausal breast cancer went down 11%. And all the libs in the media were wildly enthusiastic about this dramatic impact on women's health. So 11% in one context is cause for celebration, but 40% in another is statistically insignificant. Do I get this right? What we're witnessing today is the corruption of science and medicine at the highest levels. Make no mistake, when the branch chief of epidemiology for the National Cancer Institutes can put together a sham workshop, deny the link between abortion and breast cancer, deny it outright with the cameras rolling, turn around in 2009, six years later, and produce an even stronger association in a major journal and not be called on the carpet, not be told to either A, retract the findings of your 2003 workshop, or retract the 2009 paper, but they both cannot stand together. When they can get away with that at the highest levels, science and medicine have become thoroughly corrupted. And you gotta be careful about what you're being told by the major media. Now, that's the link between the pill and breast cancer. What does the pill do to women's bodies other than that? Well, it does a whole lot of things. Um, is it an abortifacient? How many people have heard that oral contraceptives act as an abortifacient? Okay, one of the scientific truth, it hasn't been demonstrated. That's true. We know all the pieces of the puzzle and you know, anybody, can sit down and just connect the dots because they're right there to be connected. And you can see that, okay, like these things thin the endometrial lining. And so, um, yeah, you know, you would expect that uh, an early embryo that takes about six days to travel through the fallopian tube after fertilization and then implant in the wall, that it's not going to have anything to implant into. We, we can all surmise that. And the makers of the pill will say that this may very well happen. But the truth is there have been no studies that have actually really demonstrated that. And so toward that end, um, I work with a bunch of colleagues at the American Association of Pro-Life Obstetricians and Gynecologists. And they got me together with a fellow molecular biologist down in Santiago, Chile. And so we have the first ever study going on where what we're doing is we're looking for biomarkers that are produced by, you know, those are like proteins and other things that the early embryo makes as it's rolling down through the fallopian tube. We're looking for evidence of that in the cervical mucus of women who are on the pill as well as who are not on the pill. And we're looking to show that these markers appear in the cervical mucus that show that a baby definitely has existed and if it's in women who are on the pill, and yet they don't show that they're ever pregnant, bingo, there's your smoking gun. Well, we reported out in a meeting earlier this, this year in February that in our early studies, we've indeed shown this. So now what we need to do is get enough numbers to make a statistically significant study. But early results are in, and so we have the first very early scientific results that indeed show that the combined estrogen progestin pill is an abortifacient. It has an abortifacient effect. Okay? Now, it's, it's like such a grand bag. You don't even know where to go half the time. Like, you know, you could go here, 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 here. Okay. More on the pill. The progestin only pills are associated with a three to five, per, uh, three to five times higher incidence. <coughs> of ectopic pregnancy, okay, than the estrogen only pill or the estrogen progestin pills. So there's three to five times higher incidence of ectopic pregnancy where the baby gets hung up in the fallopian tube and, and starts to develop in the fallopian tube. The truth of the matter is that for, you know, women are taking these pills for 50 years now 
And we still don't know most of what it does to women's bodies. Uh, Dr. Bob Scanlon, who's the chairman of uh, obstetrics and gynecology down at Hofstra University's medical school, one day over dinner said to me, you know, Jerry, it, it's just like taking sand and throwing it into to a machine. You just keep throwing sand in the machine. It just gets into every crevice of the machine and grinds the machine to a halt. I mean, it's very nonspecific in what it does. But in what we've been able to scientifically demonstrate, we know it's quite deadly. Now, on the issue of whether or not it's abortifacient, you have to recalibrate your vocabulary, okay? Would we all agree that conception means the penetration of an egg by a sperm, resulting in a new human organism? Can we all agree on that? How many people would agree that that's a fairly reasonable, traditional, biological definition? How many people would say that when sperm meets egg and penetrates egg and we have a new organism, that the woman is now pregnant? Even though the baby's in the fallopian tube, you still think she's pregnant, right? Okay, tradition. In 1970, the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology changed the definition of conception to mean implantation in the uterus. Yeah. They changed the definition of pregnancy to mean implantation in the uterus. What's the effect of that? When medications are being approved by the Food and Drug Administration as contraceptives, if they prevent implantation of the early embryo, they're considered a contraceptive because you're not pregnant until the baby implants. You haven't conceived until the baby implants. Nice, huh? Monsignor William Smith, who taught us moral theology at St. Joseph's, used to say, all social engineering is preceded by verbal engineering. First you change the vocabulary, and then you can change the social reality. So this is what's going on. All right, but it happened back in 1970 when I was 10 years old. So this is old news, but how many of you knew about that little verbal engineering? How many people knew that that was the case? A scattering. Why don't the media discuss these things? Why don't the media tell us what the Centers for Disease Control has to say? Okay, why? I'm not gonna say why, I think we all know why. But let's go on, condoms, right? Let's get off chemicals, let's do latex. Okay, condoms and STDs, fact sheet for public health personnel. It's not a fact sheet for the public. This is the fact sheet for public health personnel. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, it's on their website. Everything I get is off their website, so you know, feel free, right? CDC.gov, okay? It's all up there. <laughs> Here's how they lead off. Listen to this. Uh, in, in big, bold face, their opening paragraph, they say, Consistent and correct use of male latex condoms can reduce, though not eliminate, the risk of STD transmission. I'd like to repeat that. Consistent and correct use of male latex condoms can reduce, though not eliminate, the risk of STD transmission. Now, Dr. Mascolo, are we 